Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Learning Salon. We are here with um, Gualtiero for our 64th session. And uh, we are very excited to talk a little bit more. So, John, I muted you and the feedback went away. So I think you were the cause of the feedback. You might have two pages open, and I think that's what happened. If you can find the other one and close it, that would be great. And so, uh, again, the Learning Salon is a forum for discussing bridges and contentions between biological and artificial learning. And we have been with you since August 2020. It's a pleasure to have um, the audience here again. Uh, today's guest is, again, at the intersection of philosophy of um, sciences of the mind, which is at the intersection of, again, uh, a kind of a functional approach to mind and uh, understanding minds in a, in a various kinds of way. Yes, it is the 64th session. I, I can't believe it myself. It's a long number of sessions. Ilmeven Park in the chat was uh, asking if it was 64. Um, so uh, before we start, and John is going to say a few words, I just want to remind everyone, if you are a junior person or you're from outside the field, you are very much encouraged to ask a question. For clarification, please drop your questions in the chat. If you want to ask a question to the speaker, please drop in the Ask a Question area and vote on each other's questions. The more questions, the better. And um, if you'd like to appear on screen, uh, just leave the question. If you don't want to appear on screen, please say, ask for me, so we know not to invite you, but to read your question for you. We uh, 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 encourage everyone to join the screen if they can. And uh, again, uh, please feel free to ask any question also in the chat, share links, even promote your own work if it's related. That's completely accepted. And long-winded questions are also okay in this format because we have uh, provided plenty of room for that. And with that, I am going to turn off my microphone and have John introduce Gualtiero and also say a few words. Um, me. Can you hear me, Gualtiero? Okay. So I'd like to, I really am excited to um, uh, welcome Gualtiero Piccinini. Um, Gualtiero and I have known each other for years now. I think I can say that. Um, he's been an extremely wonderful interlocutor and also very generous. He sent me the sort of the drafts of his book, Neurocognitive Mechanisms, which I read all the way through. And we had really wonderful discussions about those chapters. Um, I really would like to say that anyone interested in someone who's extremely rigorous and cares a great deal about the science, but can also bring uh, philosophical training to thinking about it, read both physical computation and neurocognitive mechanisms. They are both a wonderful history of the field. They bring up very thorny issues where people vaguely talk about computation and representation. And you really want someone who's actually going through all the different ways of thinking about those things. The notion of mechanism. I think Gualtiero is one of the new mechanists, although he's a lot more than that. Um, so I think really they're required reading. Um, we've disagreed on a number of things, but I feel that they're disagreements on topics that matter, whether it's um, implicit versus explicit, cognitive versus non-cognitive, um, you know, uh, what is representation? Can one really talk about representation in sensory motor systems? I've argued no. Gualtiero thinks that representation is a real issue, which I agree with, but thinks you can apply it to those systems. I mean, just all the things that we've cared about and discussed at length on this salon, I think really Gualtiero could have been here a lot longer than the 64th session, to be honest. Um, he's a professor, distinguished professor at University of Missouri. Um, he has this new online seminar, which I'm going to read to you because I've already forgotten how long it is. It's called the International Society of Philosophy of the Sciences of the Mind. Um, and I'm very excited um, to see how, where that goes and hope I've been invited. Shameless. Um, and <laughs> um, so uh, just one last thing. I mean, uh, Gualtiero is going to be talking about um, sort of that notion that's coming back with a vengeance, you know, thinking about language of thought. Um, and I think that's really interesting. And uh, there's been a lot of recent papers coming out on that. And I'm a big fan, actually. Um, and finally, the last thing I'd like to say um, is 
you know, um, RIP to Tina Turner. It was devastating news this week to hear of a remarkable artist and force on earth. And really, I think she's an inspiration because of what she went through early in her life. A woman who was the talented one of a half of a, of a pair with Ike and escaped from that oppression and just became a phoenix of music. Um, and I think it's a great loss to everybody. Um, and I know that's not a big neuroscience issue, but I wanted you to talk about it anyway. Um, so, Gualtiero, welcome. And please share your slides and go. You're a bit muted. Can we hear you? Um, now we can, yeah. Oh, you can hear me now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you um, for having me and for attending. Um, I'm glad there's, I don't have a lot of time to talk because I, this is still in an early phase. Um, this is a joint project with David Barak uh, of the University of Pennsylvania. And um, we would like to address a question that uh, seems to have been mostly neglected in the debate about the language of thought. Uh, and that is what, uh, well, there's two questions really. One is, what do we mean by language of thought and theory or hypothesis? Um, and can we distinguish different uh, versions of different strengths? And then what requirements do they put on the machinery, the computational machinery, and do we find that in the brain? Um, so, you know, there's previous work that this builds on. Um, and just to clarify, um, distinction between software and hardware. Um, a language of thought needs appropriate software and hardware. The software would be the changeable states, like the ones and zeros in a digital computer or the spike trains in a brain. Uh, whereas the hardware is the more stable components that hold or process the states, um, such as the processor, memory registers in a digital computer, or the neurons, the networks of neurons in a brain or in a nervous system. Um, and here I want to uh, distinguish four main versions of the language of thought. The last one is the one that most people are familiar with, the one associated with Jerry Fodor and the classical computational cognitive science or computational psychology. It's not just Fodor because there are a bunch of other people who had ideas in that neighborhood. You know, one of the best known are Alan Newell and Herbert Simon. Uh, with their physical symbol system hypothesis. You know, they don't stress the notion of language as much, but it's more or less the same idea or it's in the same ballpark. But before we get there, there are at least several other steps that can be taken, and you don't have to take each subsequent one. So let's start with the weakest version, which goes back to Occam. This is an old, like, medieval idea, and it's simply the idea that at least some cognitive states or events uh, are analogous to sentences in a language. Um, or, you know, as um, some people call it, this would be just the idea that there are these language-like cognitive or mental representational states. Um, now, on top of that, you can add um, a, an account of the mechanism or the machinery for processing these representations. So, um, uh, at, at the first, um, you know, what I'm we're calling here moderate lot, moderate language of thought, it's weak lot plus the idea that there's computation and con the computational processes are those that uh, that manipulate the language-like representations. Um, and I I attribute this to Wilfred Sellers. He has a 1960 paper where he presents something along these lines. Um, then you can make assumptions, additional assumptions about what type of computation is involved. Um, now, the, the type that we're most familiar with is digital computation, the stuff that goes on in these computers that we're using uh, to connect with each other. Um, and one early um, digital language of thought hypothesis, uh, at least you know, pretty explicitly digital, is Gilbert Hartman, um, he has this book called Thought, 1973. Um, and he doesn't 
he even th you know argues that lang the language of thought is a natural language, uh, but that it's processed computationally, and it's a digital computational system that uh, that does the processing. And I, as far as if I remember correctly, he doesn't really say anything more than that. Whereas Jerry Fodor, in his famous language of thought book from 1975, makes the further assumption, which is pretty critical, that it's not just digital computation; it's Com it's program control digital computation. So the the processes are controlled by uh, computer programs. You know, a machine language. He even um, talks about you know an analogy with the machine language in a digital computer. All right. So you know, obviously this this kind of process can cover more or less uh, cognitive capacities. Um, it could be either about relatively stable states or events that unfold through time. Um, there's all kinds of uh, specific questions about, um, you know, what kind of analogy are we drawing between, uh, between the cognitive states and the, the, the sentences in language. Uh, the most basic analogies are that it, it has the pre subject predicate structure and it has some kind of combinatorial, um, structure. So you can put these things together. You know, like a sub, you know, subject with predicates, but then also these subject predicate structures with other subject predicate structures. So there's going to be ways of connecting them into, you know, more complex sentences and so forth. Um, but there's other analogies that you can draw. Okay, so I'm not going to explore all of these different um, possibilities. I, you know, again, I'm, we're just going to stick with this um, four main um versions and then you know each one of them could be further refined or could be um you know you could you could define you know more subtle variations in there um so i'll just say a little bit about each one of them and then we can have a discussion so weak lot just says some cognitive states or events are language-like um, presumably they have some kind of subject predicate structure and they can be combined in various ways um, maybe you might want to say that these constituents that form these thoughts play uh, semantic and inferential roles that are analogous to those words and sentences. It's certainly very plausible for at least discursive thought, the stuff that you can often introspect when you say, what are you thinking? You know, somebody asks you, what are you thinking about? And then you say something and you express your thoughts in language. Well, you express some thoughts that presumably had a structure that was analogous to the language. In fact, sometimes you can introspect the thoughts as they occur. Um, and also, you know, there are, you know, you can put people in scanners or at least in EEG um, sensors and you can record their brain, you know, their the, the, the neural activity while they're thinking thoughts or process sentences in a language and um, you know, there's going to be signals that, you know, mirror or correspond um, to the, you know, the, the sentences that they're thinking about. So, you know, I think this is very plausible. Um, and I doubt that there's a lot of controversy, especially if it's um, sufficiently narrow in scope. You know, it applies to certain specific types of cognitive processes or events. Um, Moderate lot as computation, you know, computation is, you know, very mainstream in neuroscience. Many, many neuroscientists, especially uh, cognitive neuroscientists, uh, computational neuroscientists, uh, subscribe to the idea that computation, you know, computations are uh, the, th the, the, the way to understand um, cognitive processes, the mechanisms for cognitive processes. Um, you know, obviously, there's an enormous body of literature, modeling. Um, uh, empirical evidence and, and discussion and debate about this. Um, you know, I've chimed in on this. I've written some books about this kind of thing and papers. So bottom line, yes, I agree with this. Um, there's definitely neural computation going on and some neural computations are going to be involved in processing language like um, representations, at least when it comes to, you know, certain kinds of cognition, linguistic type cognition, let's call it. Okay, and here I just just a brief footnote. You know, when you say, when I say, you know, sound language like representations are involved, and they might be 
you know, in, in the kind of machinery that's involved in processing natural language, I don't mean to say that you have to acquire the language before you have available these representational structures. I just mean there is some kind of neural machinery that has the capability of processing language and presumably in part because of that, it has some analogies, you know, structures that are somewhat analogous to structures that you find in um, a natural language. Um, now we get to what I think is much more problematic. So should we think that that neural computation is digital or, or at least that the, the kind of neural computation that's involved in processing language like representations is digital? Um, this is definitely an idea that's uh, been around. It's been foundational uh, in, uh, in AI, in neuroscience, in, in computational psychology. Um, there's a long history here that I'm not going through, but it goes back to Warren McCall and Walter Pitts, who offered a kind of theory that the brain works like a digital computer, roughly speaking, and it's been very influential, sometimes indirectly, directly, and sometimes indirectly. Um, and you know, the, 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 this idea comes with a software requirement. Now, the, the, the vehicles in question, the, the vehicles that you know represent. Uh, the, the contents in a language like way, um, they have to have language like features, but they have to have um, components that have a digital uh, nature. What that means, you know, we can talk about, but I, uh, you know, they're sort of like, like strings of ones and zeros, but they, um, they don't have to be just two different states, like one and zero, those are two. It could be more than two, but it's a finite number, generally it has to be pretty small to be, you know, um, reliably distinguished by the machine. Um, and then, um, strong lot requires even more. Um, and in fact, I would argue that, um, digital lot collapses into strong lot. And the reason for that is that, um, the only known way that I know of, at least, um, of processing language, like digital representations in a way that is flexible enough to at least capture the kinds of processes that are typically posited by these kinds of theories um, involves uh, computer programs, in involves instructions that say, you know, okay, you know, distinguish the, say the, 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 the subject from the predicate, you know, the syntactic properties of these things, and then use some of these syntactic features um, to, you know, manipulate them in certain appropriate ways, draw inferences and so forth. Um, but to do that, you do need um, the programs. The programs have to have a specific uh, structure, and they have to be stored in memory registers that are that are um, that are stable enough and separate from the processors. Uh, and then there's a whole spe specialized machinery for keeping track of which instruction are you executing at any given time, how to find the next instruction, how to find the next data, um, the process, and so forth. Um, and um, now, before we get to uh, the main, I guess, I, I think, you know, I don't have a lot of time left. So let me try to go um, be efficient. Um, there's, a, there's this cluster of, I call it architecture arguments for strong language of thought hypothesis, okay? Sometimes they go by productivity and systematicity. And, you know, this, this slide just says why these arguments don't work. Um, but you know, in a in a nutshell, um, brains are going to be computationally equivalent to finite state automata, or some kind of finite state automaton. There are many, 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 many ways of building uh, devices that are equivalent to finite state automaton. Um, some are digital and classical, but some are not digital. Some are not classical. Some are neither, and so on and so forth. There are many possibilities that we don't even know about yet. You know, there's a huge space of possibilities. Um, and so to find out what brains do, we do need to study brains and what we find there in terms of mechanisms and vehicles for representation. So, um, you know, we've been looking for a while, not me personally, but, you know, neuroscientists. So, <laughs> so uh, it turns out that the evidence is against um, the idea that in order to, you know, build this kind of neural um, 
computing computing device that's equivalent to a finite state automaton, you need to use the same sort of structure that you use for a digital computer with a with a machine language that in which you write programs and so on and so forth. Um, and to get a little more specific, um, you would need these digital processors that respond to probably the instructions. Nobody's found anything like that. You would need digital memory registers that hold the instructions in a stable way. Nobody's found anything like that. You need things like program counters, which are devices for keeping track of where you are in the program, you know, executing the program, and um, and then find the next instruction for the for the execution. Um, there's nothing that looks like that in a brain. Um, so uh, we don't we don't we don't have evidence that the hardware requirements for a strong language of thought are satisfied. Um, even the software requirements are not satisfied. There's no evidence of genuinely digital codes for the instructions. Um, and instead, neural representations, by and large, uh, look like what some of us philosophers call, you know, either analog um, representations or structural representations. Um, they are, you know, they have a combinatorial structure of their own but it but they're not digital they're in the sense of being built out of well-defined building blocks like ones and zeros instead you know they there's these populations of neurons and they they uh, produce firing rates and these firing rates vary and, and and these neurons of course you know are synchronized to varying degrees and so they work together in various ways so there's interesting you know higher level uh variables that uh, presumably relevant to uh, cognitive processing. Um, you know, I'm not certain. I'm certainly not saying that we have to just focus on individual neurons. Um, but the point is that if you look at the kinds of tools that are used to understand what neurons do and what populations of neurons do, they don't look like the models that you use for understanding digital computers. That's one way to put it. Um, so, you know, one, another way to put it is that neural computation is sui generis. It's, it's not digital and it's not even analog in a strict sense of analog. That's compatible with the representations being analog. We, you know, I don't want to get in, too into the terminology because, you know, I want to keep it short as I was asked to keep it short. Okay. So um, my con tentative conclusion, um, there's a lot of work to do to really defend this, but the conclusion is that uh, the behavioral evidence that's usually offered by proponents of the strong language of thought hypothesis only supports uh, weak or maybe moderate language of thought hypothesis. Um, the software and hardware requirements for either digital or strong language of thought are not satisfied. Um, so, you know, the, 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 the really well-known famous an influential version of the language of thought, which is the strong one, is not really compatible with what we have learned about neural representations and computations. So I think, you know, the, the strong lot is um, not likely to be true. Digital lot collapses into strong lot, so it's also not likely to be true. But the moderate language of thought is plausible for at least some cognitive processes. So you know, there's still something to, uh, to salvage here um, in this language of thought idea. Um, thank you. And I will try to close this now. Uh, yes. Thank you so much. That was so timely and so interesting. Um, before we start, just a question. Uh, could you remind us of the major difference between strong and the moderate that makes the plausibility happen? What is the main claim? As opposed to the evidence counter, what is the main claim that seems to be false in the strong but true in the moderate? Right, thank you. Um, there's there's really at least two axes on which they can differ. One is the scope. How much of cognition do they cover? So the more moderate language of thought says, well, only some special kinds of cognitive processes are language-like or, or cognitive represent or representations are, are, are language-like, but there's other types that are not. Whereas, you know, the more you go towards like 
all cognition is explained by language like representation, the stronger you get. But the one that I think is most relevant for my purposes in this, or our purposes, David Barrick is part of this project, sorry. Um, for our purposes, the, 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 the division that matters most is between just simply claiming that there's neural computation over representations that in some cases are language-like, and then claiming that there's a very specific type of architecture for this computational system, and that is similar, very similar, or virtually the same as that of a digital computer. So that would be the strong law saying it's, a, it's like a digital computer, it has digital programs, that are stored in a memory register or in a bunch of memory registers, and they have to be fetched and executed by a processor. And then the pro, you know, and then there's data, and you, so the data are language-like, but the instructions are also language-like, and the instructions are executed on the data, and that's how you do these computations. Um, so Jerry Fodor in particular is very explicit that this is the kind of analogy he, that he's thinking of. Um, that there is both. Maybe he doesn't always say it in this way, but you know, there's places where this is clearly what he means. You know, there's data that are language-like, but there's also instructions that are language-like, and the instructions are executed on the data. And just to follow up on that, uh, I guess two questions. First, is this a hard requirement or the strong requirement in some sense? Uh, closer to Chomsky's idea that there is some kind of innate architecture for a language or not. And second, um, and we can come to come back to that after you answer the first one, I want to ask about consequences for the idea of claims of AGI for language models. Okay, so I think the, 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 the initial question was, is this related to Chomsky's idea that there is innate uh, knowledge of a language um, or it, architectures, or, ar yeah. or there are innate architectures that innate empower architecture. language and thought in addition. So is yes. it like almost like a furthering of Chomsky's claim? Yeah. So, okay. So, right. Absolutely. So the way Fodor intended it, it was closely allied with the Chomsky position that um, there's innate, yeah, architecture for acquiring and, and processing a language, but it goes beyond because for Chomsky, this was specific to the language faculty. For Fodor, it also you know, includes other perceptual systems, not just um, you know, processing language itself, but also processing other types of inputs and even motor control. You know, he has a famous 1968 paper about tacit knowledge, can't remember the exact title, in which he says, something along the lines of motor control is based on program execution. Um, I'll repeat now, the second question. Is that, is that where you want to go or not yet? Well, what I want to say is that you can, you know, you don't have, you're not, it's not mandatory to go nativist for a, you know, strong language of thought hypothesis. You could, um, you, you know, you, you, as long as you have enough, you know, machinery for acquiring the relevant architecture as you, you know, go through development, um, you, you know, you might be able to acquire that. Alan Turing had an idea like that. You know, he says somewhere, um, you know, you could start with a, with a learning machine and then train it to become a universal Turing machine so that by the time it's a universal Turing machine, you know, it's able to execute programs, you know, digital programs, kind of like a digital computer, but it gets there by learning. So it's trained to do that, to become that. And, you know, to some degree, I think in a very modest way, our brains are like that. I mean, we can do arithmetic in our head. We can, or, you know, even with piece of paper and pencil. Um, so we are a sort of universal Turing machine, at least through learning, but, you know, in a, with very limited scope. So, you know, we can, you know, we can write down instructions on a piece of paper and then follow them and apply them to any 
data that we want for as long as we have enough kind of attention and, and memory available. So, so, you know, but that's a very, very limited version of that idea. You know, what Fodor was trying to do is say there's something like that that's, you know, built in. In, in his case, it was also innate, but even if it's not innate, it's like, driving a lot of cognition it's not just like when you, you know when you take a student and you say okay follow these instructions it's also going on in, unconsciously behind a lot of our cognitive processes these are fantastic segues into the second question because um, a lot of people are expecting or claiming and this is the biggest divide i've seen in my career in my lifetime between people some people believe that large language models and training them on next work prediction can have can lead to emergence all the possible cognitive function abilities. And some say, no, it can't. It might appear like that because it's parroting something. And uh, some take another position and they say, oh, because they've been trained so predictively at different scales, what they are now is they are getting close to being Turing machines and then you can tell them what to do and they're programmable and this, the programming language is now a language, natural language. And then they talk about ICL or in-context learning and there's some folks working on meta and context learning and they claim that now what we have here itself is like a trainable computer and uh, how you can program it to do something is through language. It seems like we are going back to those divisions in some way. And uh, some, uh, I think the idea that this is enough to emerge all kinds of cognition might be on the Fodorian side. Whereas, and I don't know, maybe it's not, maybe you disagree, I'd like to hear what you think. And then the people who say it's entirely parroting might be on the weak side of the LOT. And the people in between, maybe on the moderate side who are saying that this is basically at this point like a, a programmable machine that it's a uh, programming language is language. So I'd love to hear your thoughts. And maybe I said something that you disagree with, I'd love to uh, see how you think about it. Yeah, yeah, thanks. That's a beautiful uh, point. And question. Um, I'm not enough of an expert on large language models to have a strong opinion about this, but I do have a weak opinion. Um, and <laughs> that is, um, I think saying they're just, so, you, you know, what, I think what you're getting at with the parenting idea is, oh, uh, sometimes it's put in terms of, uh, it, it's just a bunch of statistics. And uh, it's like a huge statistical correlational thing where you know, it puts together all these correlations and then, you know, it generates um, language through exploiting the correlations, but it doesn't really understand anything. It doesn't really represent what's being said and so forth. I think that's, uh, I would say, almost certainly wrong. Almost certainly. I think we lost you. Uh oh. Oh, you're back. You're back. No oh, worries. Okay. You're back. It seems okay. like it was a momentary Wi Fi. Please go ahead. Yeah. So I would, I, I, I'm inclined to rule out the it's just parroting kind of um, account of large language models. I'm also inclined to rule out the, 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 the full blown, oh, it's, a, it's basically a universal Turing machine by now um, for a number of reasons. But um, the main one being that the architectural structure, the proper architectural structure of a universal Turing machine is, is, is better defined and, and more precise and more rigorous than anything that could just be acquired by, by a, you know, a finite system like a large language model um, through this, the sort of training that goes through. Um, so I guess I would think that something in the middle is much more likely. You know, you were kind of talking about the emergence of some kind of cognitive structure there. Um, exactly how much structure and exactly how powerful it is, is a question that I'm going to leave to people who know more about large language models than I do. Um, but certainly, yeah, there is a lot of language like structure going on in large language models. Otherwise, how could they produce language that is so uh, good? So that that in a way also refutes um, the need the 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 argument that we that you need um, prior uh, innate architecture in order to acquire the ability to process the language. 
I think. There's a, there's a really good book by a uh, philosopher, Cameron Bachner, um, who has really, uh, is really delving into this business about, you know, nativism versus empiricism and uses uh, contemporary artificial intelligence models to make this kind of point. So really, uh, he's made it much more in a much more articulate way than what I just said. And I recommend his book. Um, it's, I think it's in press, so it's going to come out soon. Yeah, so you said, uh, just to um, summarize, uh, maybe the, uh, the most, uh, I guess, something that everyone can agree on is that uh, without that innate architecture, it's possible to have what uh, the a recent um, MIT paper, Mahu al -Azal, is calling uh, formal linguistic capacities, just the ability to speak. But when it comes to, and so that part can be kind of like put aside. Then there is the functional cognitive capacities that are not just about language. And some claim that all of these can emerge from uh, just uh, these language models. And a lot of us are showing that, well, no, not quite. It hasn't quite emerged. On that side, it seems like that's also maybe not hardware for Dorian, but that's kind of like a, a software for Dorian assumption that once you have the formal linguistic capacities, you can have all the other functional cognitive capacities. But uh, is it correct in my understanding that you're disagreeing with that as well? You're saying you can't get all functional cognition fallout or trickle uh, just from having formal linguistic capacities. Um, yeah, I don't know if I fully understand the question um the question is if something a language model learns to use language in a way that everybody understands does it mean that it has mastered cognition that we consider non-linguistic for instance planning planning is not a linguistic only a linguistic ability. Yeah. plan without language animals can plan without having language yeah. Uh, does the functional cognitive ability or do all co functional cognitive abilities fall out of or follow if you have formal linguistic ability? I think Fodor yeah. would say yes. And um, people who are less language of thought would say no, not necessarily, right? Um, I don't know if Fodor would say yes. Um, I would say... I would be at least tentatively skeptical um, that mastering language is enough to master all cognitive capacities, even like high level cognitive capacities. Um, I think it's better for people who know more about th these matters to really say more, but um, you know, the Cameron Buckner, whom, whose book I mentioned before, and I don't remember, somebody asked, what's the book again? I, if they're talking about that one, I don't remember the title off the top of my head because it's changed. It was initially called Deeply Rational Machines, but now it's called something else. Um, but Cameron Buckner, if you look up the name, you know, you'll find him and you'll find that he has a book in press and it's a very good book. Um, and he goes into, and so his main idea is that, um, a, well, two main ideas. A, things like large language models show that you don't need a lot of innate architectural structure to acquire these capacities. And then B, uh, you probably need multiple types of these, you know, AI systems um, kind of corresponding to different faculties, you know, things like perception, imagination, language, you know, planning, you know, emotion. Um, you need to combine these different things uh, and different, uh, you know, different AI archite architectures might be better suited for some of these different capacities, different faculties. And then if you combine them all, you might be, get closer to something that has the kind of intelligence or the, the, the full range of capacities that we have. I tend to agree with that. So thank you for that. Um, just because I, I might need to go and take a flight soon, maybe I'll read a couple of questions before John asks his questions. Uh, Nazim asks, taking Dennett's chess playing machine example, does the thought of playing the queen early, uh, can it be seen as predictive coding from a machine via the human's simple thought of it without executing the action quite yet? Um, not sure how it's related here, but do you understand the question? 
I think so. Um, okay. I think you know the question is, does the does the chess playing machine uh, think uh, it's a good idea to get the queen out early? Um, and I think that the same answer can apply to both a chess playing machine and a human being playing chess. Some uh, some humans might be you know, either taught or uh, they come to the conclusion on their own that under certain circumstances, it's good to get the queen out early. And that's explicitly represented somewhere in their brain. And it plays a role in their strategy. But it could also be that through lots of um, playing, they end up develop the, the, developing the habit of getting the queen out early without ever representing that explicitly or that driving their strategy explicitly or being part of an inference or part of planning how to play chess. And the same thing could be going on in the machine, meaning either, either option is viable within either human or machine. That's great. And I think uh, we had uh, a question from Mihai, and they feel like there are a number of uh, terminology that they don't understand. So um, uh, Mihai says that they will ask again. Uh, uh, Ilmenin Park asks, are there any fundamentally non-digital or more strongly continuous aspects of language or thought? So the way I think about it, and it might be naive, but you know, I'm just a philosopher. What what can you say? Um, is that, uh, you know, when we have discursive thoughts, uh, that is a, a, a an event. You know, it's a it's a it's a process that unfolds over time. For the most part, at least. Sometimes we have these like sudden insights, like like almost like a fully formed thought that just kind of springs to mind. But a lot of times we have this inner dialogue. It might be more verbal or it might be more quiet, more silent. Some people report something more like speaking to themselves in their head. And some people report something closer to hearing words in their head. But either way, it's um, it's their own thoughts. OK, and it feels ling language like it feels linguistic and it unfolds. So what could that course? What could correspond to that in a brain? you know, my guess is based on like the very limited knowledge of neuroscience that I have is, you know, a bunch of neuron populations that generate a, a large, you know, a stream of firing rates from different populations structured in a certain way. And from the inside, you know, it feels like either uh, you know, a voice in our head, either that we hear it or that we speak it or just the content. Some, some people report um, just the content of the thoughts without the voice, you know, without the words. So, you know, you, you could conceivably record neural signatures of that with EEG or some other scanning um, uh, 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 technology, but it's, it's, you know, basically the ingredients are, you know, firing rates from neural populations and some complicated comp combinations, and there has to be some kind of generative mechanism for, for the unfolding that's going on, um, you know, I don't have a very like articulated theory of how that goes, but um, it's not quite what goes on in a digital computer where you have memory registers, you can stick these strings of digits there, and you can hold them there until you need them again. And then, you know, you put them in the data path, you know, and then you perform operations and then but then you put them back in memory and all that. Um, so it's not, you know, it, it, it's, if I had to guess, it's not like a strong language of thought. It's more like a moderate language of thought. And you spoke a couple of times about the structure of these neural representations that are required for thought. Yeah. Um, do you mind telling us a little bit more about what assumptions or hypothesis you're making about this structure yeah, that is required good. for thought? Right. So um, one thing that <laughs> that we should distinguish is between my kind of modality specific neural representations and more modality neutral or amodal neural representations. 
Um, and this is something that um, might be relevant to some of John's concerns that he's had in the past, you know, about things that I've said. Um, but certainly about a lot of these, you know, debates between classical computational theories and connectionist or neurocomputational theories. Um, you know, sometimes these classical theorists think, well, you know, we believe in these amodal representations. They're language-like, they're not perception-based, they're not sensory motor, they're not tied to a specific modality, visual, auditory, or something. Um, but there's no reason why somebody who doesn't buy the classical story for the architecture couldn't also believe in amodal or modally neutral neural representations. Um, meaning, yes, there's a lot of sensory processing that's modality specific. Of course, there's the visual system, there's the auditory system, there's the olfactory system, there's you know sensory motor system, there's all this stuff, but there's no particular reason why there can't be neural systems that you know integrate or respond to different types of inputs and can sort of correlate, respond to, represent represent information that in a way that's modality, modality neutral or amodal. Um, so something that represents um, houses or dogs or bicycles, not through their shape, not through the way they sound, not through the way they smell or how they feel when you touch them, but just as such, that doesn't mean that it's a word in a like digitally encoded language. It could still be, you know, a bunch of neurons firing with a certain frequency in a certain population that's connected with all kinds of other systems in an appropriate way. And so that when those fire, it represents just bicycles or houses or dogs. And you can put that together with you know, other neural populations that also in an amodal way represent, you know, riding the bicycle or building the house or, you know, the dog barking and so forth. So, um, so if it's a bunch of neurons and they're firing at a certain rate and they're connected to other populations in an appropriate way, and then, you know, you can, you can generate, you know, events of, these populations following each other, um, you, you know, that would be a way to implement the thought the dog is barking or I'm riding the bicycle. And so there's a structure there. There's a structure because, you know, these different populations follow each other and they're, you know, they're synchronized to kind of make them kind of work together. But, but it's not, it's not like in a digital computer and it's not, you know, a digital structure. Thank you. I could ask so much more, so many more questions, but am I understanding correctly that you're thinking about different scales of abstraction? Yes. And there is maybe modality at some level, but there are various scales and the same concept, um, different scales of abstraction might at some level of abstraction become a model, uh, uh, mean something else, maybe context dependent, maybe in an affordance like way, or maybe in other way. Yes, absolutely. Again, I'm going to cite Cameron again because he talks a lot about abstraction in as a feature of neural systems. He's talking about AI, but you know, he's also implicitly or directly talking about the brain. I mean, the point of the book is to use AI to shed light on neural neurocognitive processes. And so he makes the case that some of these AI techniques like large language models provide a concrete and deep and, and rigorous um, type of machinery and some at least partial understanding of how abstraction would work, could work in the brain or in the nervous system in a way that's consistent with an empiricist uh, framework, meaning that you start from a relatively low level of architectural structure and then you build up this you know, representational knowledge without having to have a lot of innate structure. Now, I think how much of it is innate, how much of it is acquired is an empirical question for us. Um, but it's very interesting that these um, AI, you know, contemporary AI tools can learn so much from more or less scratch.
So it seems like this is related to Mihai's question, the relationship between memory and this higher level of thought. It seems like you're saying for lower level things, maybe the uh, innate architecture matters, but when you are going on top, maybe some general architecture would be sufficient. And with that, I hand it to John, by the way. That, that's the last thing I want to say. Thank you. So, Gualtiero, uh, I think there's a lot of interesting stuff going on, but you know, I don't actually agree with Cameron on a lot of this. We should have him on. I actually think that he's a bit confused about language and cognition, but that's okay. Um, I do think what is interesting, you know, Ida and I were actually at a meeting together at Santa Fe Institute where I think it might be very interesting when you look at things like Jake Quilty Dunn's work and stuff that Chaz Firestone is doing, where they're talking about a language of thought architecture for non-discursive, non-discursive, non-overt deliberative thought. I mean, the nice thing about their work is that they're suggesting, and Josh Tenenbaum, as they argue, has a probabilistic language of thought set up. Um, so I do think it's interesting that there's the sensory motor story which can be sort of more deep neural networks. You don't have to be representational. Then there's all this nice work suggesting that there is a language of thought for implicit system one-like behavior, and I buy that. And then there's what you're talking about, where it seems to have most traction going back to Fodor, the discursive, overt, deliberative, cognitive things we do. And, you know, just to be very concrete, when you have a pen, I have a pen here, and my brain is going down onto the paper with the pen and outcome words from the pen. The question you have to ask yourself is what was in the brain just before the pen hit the page and the words came out? In other words, it's once you go, you, you, it's gonna be very strange to say that as soon as the pen hits the paper and words and symbols come out discreetly, combinatorially, it's clearly linguistic, but before the pen hits the page, it doesn't have that kind of structure at all. I mean, it's completely idiotic, right? In other words, there has to be some, some mapping between what's in your brain just before the pen hits the page, right? So we have yes. to have some sort of language. Uh, can, I, can I just say one quick thing about that? Yeah, that's why I get really irritated with these, you know, language is all social family of yeah. theories. Uh, it's all public. It's all just in, in the world. And there doesn't have to be anything at all like that in the brain. Well, then how do we generate this stuff? And I can actually give you something better than that. I'm writing about it actually in this book that I've been working on. Um, I'll be a neurologist. There are things called hypercognitive seizures, right? Where very much like what Wilder Penfield found when he was going into parts of the temporal lobe and the frontal lobe with an electrode, is you can elicit thoughts and words and images stereotypically just by sticking an electrode into the brain, right? So what does it mean that it's social in the world? They're stuck on an operating room table and you're literally sticking an electrode into their brain and out comes a word, an image, a thought. They're called forced thoughts, which is what they originally called. So of course it's in the brain. And I, I agree with you entirely that, oh, it's just sensory motor systems and culture and out comes cognition. It's just not, it's not even worth discussing. I agree with you, right? So anyway, um, so, uh, but I wonder about computation. I've noticed in the chat, people talking about universal Turing machines, and then you've written beautifully about representation. And now you're beginning to write about language of thought. So I would just wondered maybe for everyone, if you could just say how they fit together. In other words, that, you know, computation in the brain is neither digital or analog. That's an implementational argument. You know, you agree, like David Barak, you're working with, you know, one could consider cognition, you know, operations on representations. Which is the superordinate term and which is the subordinate term for you? In other words, is language of thought a particular version of representation over which one operates. And you're just saying that for certain cognitive operations, the representations have to have some of the features of language of thought to be operated on. So I'm just wanting to know, given your history of work, 
what is superordinate and what is subordinate? Do you see what I'm saying? I'm I think so. struggling with, is, is language of thought just your latest specialization um, on your general notion of physical computation on representations? Uh, yes. Um, so, so there's, there's, there's neural represent. So one thing that, um, some of these classical theorists, defenders of the strong language of thought, or what they might think of as going in the direction of the strong language of thought, um, don't seem to appreciate it very much, uh, is that, you know, there's a large body of information, of, of, of evidence about neural representations and neural computations. And we do find these things in the brain, or at least this is like our mainstream better, best understanding of what's happening in the brain. Um, so we're better off at least trying to extend this idea in the directions that we like or in the direction that seem more fruitful, including language, than just start from the armchair and say, oh, we think it must be like this. And then, you know, it, the brain must work like this. Um, because we do know a few things about the brain, not as much as we would like, but we do, you know, that's better than nothing. It's certainly better than what Fodor knew in the sixties and when he was writing his book. Um, so yeah, so there's, there's neural representations, the neural computations that process these representations. And then in some cases, they're going to be, you know, they're going to have something to do with a language like structure, uh, at least the representations, the data you know, the data. I, I don't think there's anything quite like computer instructions in the brain, although there may well be important control signals that shape the processing, you know, in other areas or, you know, in interesting ways. Um, but there's also, um, um, I guess what I was trying to say, Gualtero, is when you wrote your articles on representation in motor cortex and sensory cortex, I mean, I don't think the word representation should be used there. I disagree with you about that. But at least we could agree that you don't think that you need to have a language of thought approach for motor cortex, right? In other words, yeah. or spinal cord reflexes or basal ganglia function at some point discussion about computations over representations, the language of thought, you know, discrete, symbolic, combinatorial, you know, syntax separated from semantics. I mean, you know, the list of features that have a language of thought, at some point the nervous system does things that deserve a language of thought treatment, right? But some right. things don't, and those some things that don't you still use representation and computational language for. So mm -hmm. it therefore seems to me that there are some representations and some computations that deserve a language of thought treatment and others do not. Yes. Where's the boundary? Um, so I think it, there's kind of a continuum of types of representations and, and computations that go with them. Uh, from simpler ones to more complex ones. And I, I mean, this is the case even in digital computers. You know, you digital computers are built out of logic gates. Logic gates are very, very simple processing units. Um, they're equivalent to McCollum Pitts neurons. Um, and then, you know, you put them together, a few of them can, can form these simple Boolean circuits. And then you put them together in slightly more complex ways. It can do combinational circuits. And then you put those together in interesting ways. You can get full-blown arithmetic logic units and, and data paths. And, and with the appropriate control, you build a processor. And, you know, then you need memory for the storing. Sure, stages. but that's good. I get that. But, I mean, still, so that, in other words. You can start with, like, something very simple and get something yeah, but very it, complex. Sure, but that's more. like saying right but you can say that you can start a, you can use bricks to build a wall and ultimately you can get the taj mahal right the taj mahal is not a slightly more complex wall it's completely different right so in other words talking about building up continuously there are junctures right so in other words yeah 
the language, so in other words, the language of thought seems to me to be this idea that there are objects that are some sort of primitive or kernel that can be used and combined in a language-like way to form predicate-like arguments. Mm -hmm. there, there have to be a list of features yeah. that the language yeah. of thought has without having to get to language. Yeah. And that there are many cognitive operations that seem to require those features. And, you know, Charles Firestone has written very nicely about, you know, and people talking about object files, object tracking, and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I, I just want to make sure that we know what's at stake, which is that we agree that there are certain cognitive behaviors that it will be very hard to posit without some of these core features of language of thought. Right, it would just be hard, and there are other behaviors where you don't need it, right? Um, but and I think I just can't imagine that not being the case, even before you get to writing out equations or speaking language or writing sentences. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so I don't think there's, I, I mean, I just don't know how people could deny that. I think when you talk about your digital objection, to me, that's an implementational objection. You're saying, however the language of thought is constructed, it's not going to be a von Neumann architecture, right? Fine. Who? It seems to me almost like a non-issue, right? In other words, the language of thought argument is a lot more interesting than simply claiming that however it's constructed, it's not digital. I mean, yeah, yeah I just, okay. I, Can I, I stop you there, though? Boring argument, right? It, language of thought is more interesting than that. It is more interesting. That's part of what I'm saying. But there, but it's, but this is not irrelevant because um, uh, some, even some of the ideas and people that you mentioned, um, at least in some of the writings that I've seen, make claims that commit them to a certain kind of architecture that's very much like that of a digital computer. With, who is that? Who, who, in, who after so the notion who of just an, now? so object files as the, as they're often defined, they sound very much like digital representational structures. Um, and there's this one paper that I read recently um, that says that in order to implement object files, you're going to need this um, um, um addressable memory registers like those of a digital computer um and they 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 cite randy gallistow who himself says that you need this the digital architecture like you know roughly speaking like a von neumann machine with memory registers where you can store these things over time and retrieve them when you need to process them and then you know he ends up saying that it's probably molecular inside of neurons and you know, I'd like to hear the story of how that goes. But um, so the, this, these ideas are still there, and if you dig, sometimes you find them underneath some of this appeal to sure, object files. But, I mean, and object but, files. Just, but you know, when you look at the work on object files and you know object tracking, and you know, you you can have a red triangle hide behind an uh, a, an occluder, and then it comes out blue. And you still go, I can identify it as a triangle, even though the colors change. The idea that you can independently unpack the features of the object, mm -hmm. right? Which is a language of thought like thing. Triangle, red, blue, they're not all one glued thing, right? Now, those kind of beautiful experiments, which are very language of thought, right? No one cares as it has a digital architecture. I mean, I don't think Charles Firestone would ever make such a claim. So I, I'm. You know, I, I'm just finding it now. I agree that people like Randy, because they've got this belief that there's a digital like code in RNA, which is where memory resides. But I think for the purposes of thinking hard about how to do cognition and think that there's a language of thought architecture and that you can have, you can track an object, right? You can have an object move through a series of distractors and you can keep your eye on it, right? And, and, and all those beautiful kinds of experiments, which really do suggest a language of thought for perception, that's interesting, right? The fact that you can do like um, Jake Quilty Dunn 
uses in his paper, he talks about the, the fact that you can do fast inferential logic way below the level of conscious thought, right? You just get interference at short reaction times. You know, I spoke about this. These are all very interesting phenomena that we should talk about. But it just seems to me that if you start talking about universal Turing machines and digital computers, we distract from what is interesting about positing language of thought for certain cognitive operations, right? I mean, it, 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 it seems like we're killing straw men and women doing that when really it's like Ida's questions that there's something more interesting about positing language of thought versus non-representational connectionist accounts, sensory motor accounts, right? It, that's what we should be worrying about is, is there value for a 2.0 version of language of thought and stop going on and on and on about Fodor and digital and it, 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 it survives that, does it not? We, we, it's still useful even if you slay those sacred cows or do yeah. we always need, do, am I wrong about that? Um, I think you're at least largely right. Um, I think that that is partly my point. Um, but I also want to point out that some of these um, hypotheses, some of these specific hypotheses about language of thought being involved in, say, visual perception leave me less enthusiastic than you, um, in part because um when when we you know we remove some of this clutter of you know architectural assumptions and 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 we look at what we seem to understand about the visual system uh it seems that we could give a representational um and computational account of these phenomena that maybe doesn't require anything that's very language like so yes there will, there's going to be some kind some kind of cognition cognitive process where we we need some something very language like um visual perception maybe for some maybe for some uh, kinds of visual processes it could start to look a little bit language like I'm not very convinced by those experiments, but just and, and then the other thing which I find kind of interesting, and you do and you've done this, and we've argued about this before, is you know the need to talk about discrete, filler independent, combinatorial kernels or primitives that one can do certain cognitive operations with, and you can have your favorite list, and that's all very interesting, and I agree with you about all that. But then you talk about neurons firing and that's your alternative to this sort of digital architecture. But to be quite honest, um, we don't really know how these features of language of thought that are picked up by the cognitive scientists or the linguists are implemented. And I would really like to push you on whether there's anything that we've learned neurally so far that has really given us much extra insight into the modern type of cognitive science that people are doing or you know linguistics or psychology how has the neural data qualitatively changed the way we think about language of thought once you ditch the stuff that i correctly agree with you we should be ditching you seem to be much more enthralled by neural data than 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 any conceptual work that i think it's done um well okay so you're kind of reaching or pushing me near the end of my competence once again um you know don't forget i'm just a mere philosopher <laughs> but that being said I, I you know i read a little bit here and there um and there's a beautiful story told among other people by uh grace Lindsay about how starting with hubel and weasel simple and complex cells um you know, somebody whose name I forgot came up with the idea of a um, multi-layered, you know, deep neural network um, now called convolutional um, that has these all these different layers of um, simple and complex cells, and each layer ends up 
kind of abstracting more um, higher level or complex features of a visual stimulus. And that inf influenced or inspired the contemporary deep convolutional neural network idea, which then eventually was scaled up and became so powerful. And then in the last 10 or so years, there's been at least some evidence collected that um, the features that are represented or responded to by the deeper layers of, um, of a convolutional neural network that, that is able to categorize visual stimuli at a near human level of competence predict the kinds of response properties of sub, you know, like pr uh, subsequent areas of the visual. Um, What's know, that got to do with cognition? I've got nothing to do with cognition. Okay, so perception is not part of cognition in your opinion? No, no, it's not perception. I mean, just to be very clear, all that work on object yeah. recognition hasn't solved the perception problem at all. Hasn't solved right? the, what, the, the problem? The what problem? Perception problem. Perception. The perception problem. We still don't. Perception is a conscious, it's not the same as detection, right? Sure. And it's very interesting. If you look at the work like Jim DiCarlo has done, you yeah. know, some of the more interesting things, like perceiving a monkey in a deep forest where you only see bits of it, where these, where these models start to fail, what he's shown is you need prefrontal cortex input for that to happen. Uh -huh. Okay. And what's interesting is there are no models in that framework for the prefrontal cortex, right? I mean, there's work being done, but it's not the same deep neural net architecture that the ventral stream has. You have to think about other things, mm -hmm. right? So in other words, you, 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 it seems interesting to me. And I don't think anyone thinks that you have to invoke language of thought to explain a feed forward combinational deep neural network doing object recognition. But that's right. exactly what you don't need to invoke language of thought. Yeah. So, so, so in other words, so I'm asking you again, where in the neuroscience have we gotten something that really is beginning to change the way that we think about language of thought? You can't use the ventral object stream for that. Right, right. So, well, I, I was answering a different question there. I was answering the question, where does, you know, neural evidence uh, give, give us, you know, useful information for understanding uh, some cognitive process. No, 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 I was saying language of thought. In, yeah. in terms of all the types of thinking about language of thought that you nicely delineate, mm -hmm. and you come up with all the different ones, weak, strong, digital, non-digital, you know, yes, you can use the neural data to say that the digital separation seems to be unlikely, but that's a negative contribution. Mm -hmm, What's mm -hmm. the positive contribution that neuroscience has made to how yeah. language is constituted? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. Um, that was that's part of the research project here. Um, I did recently found a article that I haven't read yet on acquiring the processes. I mean, properties of um, of linguistic uh, syntax through the kind of learning that neural networks go through. Um, and I would be, I would really, really be interested in reading that. But I, that work, I think you're talking about work by Ev Federenko and Anne, you know, uh, doing her name, we met her, um, you know, where they've begun to notice transformer like architecture in the temporal, you know, that is like temporal lobe architecture for language, right? And making the case that all of us might benefit from doing next word prediction. You know, we do that, right? Say the word tulip and your, what your lips are already forming the P before the T comes out, right? Mm -hmm. So it may be useful to do that sort of prediction later, but the point they make is that language and cognition are quite separate, mm -hmm. right? And, the, and, and the, I mean, they also make that case very strongly. In fact, they made it at the meeting that Ida and I were at. So I'm just saying that we're in an interesting place where language of thought has come back as a way of thinking about how certain cognitive operations happen, not just linguistic ones, but, Actually, the neuroscience of the bits that are interesting, like Ida's interested in, the prefrontal cortex, the bits that are doing the thinking bit attached to the language bit, we have work to do still about how to match the neural data onto the language of thought way of thinking. And, you know, it's work that still needs to be done. And some people don't like language of thought, 
because they think it's the return of GoFi, right? Yeah. And or maybe not. Maybe prefrontal cortex shows us that LOT doesn't work out for higher order thought. It might, you know? right? It might. But it, it, it seems to me that it's difficult to describe cognition of certain kinds, like writing and doing math in your head, you know. When you say, John, what's four plus four plus eight? I mean, how else are you going to describe this? You know, and that's not implementation, right? That, that of course, it's neurons doing that. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So, but I'm just not sure. I mean, I'm interested to see what you and David do, but I'm not convinced that we really know how to think neurally about language of thought. Well. <laughs> There's plenty more that we need to figure out. I, I yeah. would agree with that. So anyway, I, this is great. I really love your, and I'm very interested to see what you and David do. Um, but there are lots of questions out here. So, you know, um, let's see <laughs> what we can do here. Maybe, uh, this, we maybe this last one from, yeah, Mihai says, in what way does a digital computer or a von Neumann or other specific architecture constitute a limitation? For having language of thought because the discussion seems to fall back on how computers are different from brains but not why in principle there would be an incompatibility i'm not sure if that's clear he later on manages to uh, he clarifies that with saying that a functionalist view would separate the implementation level i'm not sure if that's the level we're talking about but i leave it to you uh go to your see how you feel about it. yeah um well, yeah, that's a very interesting question. There, you know, in principle, I wouldn't say that there is any theoretical incompatibility. The brain could have been set up like a, let's call it von Neumann machine. I don't really like that term because I think it's very ambiguous, but, you know, as a shorthand, let's go with that. Um, and it's just an empirical fact that it's not. Um, but maybe, at least, maybe, um, there is a conceptual difficulty, um, and I don't know if it would be easily solvable with trying to set up a brain like a von Neumann type machine. And what that is, is that in a digital computer, like a von Neumann machine, let's call it, um, the pro the computations are set up to mirror the property the semantic properties of the representations but the semantic properties of representations themselves there's an important sense in which they don't have they're not causal powers of the representations they don't affect the computations in a causal way um so what I mean by that is that the driver of the process is the instructions and how the instructions set up the processor to perform certain operations of the data, whether the data means something or not, what the data mean is not really um, a factor in how the data are processed, okay? Um, so at least for these artifacts that we build, we have to set up the program so that they process the data in the right way that corresponds to the, what the data mean to us. Okay, so the, the, the semantic properties are derivative, not original. This is like philosophical language. That's what, you know, for example, John Hopin calls these, you know, draws this distinction. Um, so derivative semantic property is one that, you know, depends on an interpreter, you know, the, the user of the computer. Whereas an original semantic property is something that is built into some in more or less intrinsic feature of the representation itself as it functions within its system. And for neural representations, there's a very reasonable case to be made that those are original representations with original semantic content, meaning whatever they represent, they represent on their own, they independent, you know, on the grounds of how they function within the system, if you will, or what they respond to, what, what the system, you know, activates them in response to. So 
it's the system itself that has functions that makes those representations of this thing and not that thing, um, as opposed to having to set up the process to match the meaning. Well, the meaning really comes from the interpreter. Okay, so um, so there's an important difference between the role of representations as semantic entities, you know, with content in a brain versus in a von Neumann architecture, um, where in the brain, the representations and the processes that manipulate them, namely what we normally call the computations, those are acquired together, okay? They're two faces of the same coin. Um, the, as, the, as the system is built through development or develops through learning, um, it, it acquires both at the same time. It acquires both, you know, the, the contents of the representations and the ability to process them. And part of the ability to process them is what gives them the content that they have because, you know, you, you, you know you, if you start with like sensory streams of information, you know, you, you then abstract away features until you, whatever, recognize objects and so forth and think about them. Well, they represent these, these thoughts or these perceptions that represent those objects because there's a whole stream of processing behind it that activates them under certain circumstances, you know, when those objects are there and they not they may or may not be fully visible, et cetera, et cetera. So, so there's this sort of original semantic properties aspect to neural representations and computations that a Neumann architecture by itself doesn't have, and it's not entirely obvious how it would be able to acquire it if the brain was built like that. I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying it's, you know, it's trickier for a Neumann architecture. And again, again, it just seems to me, Grotto, it just, we keep going back to Van Neumann architecture well, that was a question. and stuff. That was I mean, a question. No, I understand, but I mean, it seems to me, I mean, even the work again that's been done, you know, it sounds, you know, that Chomsky's sort of insistence on the separation of syntax and semantics, very much a little bit like what you're saying, the data is in one form and then it gets processed and you can be completely agnostic about there's any meaning in there, you just need to generate the syntactical rules operating on it. But, you know, again, beautiful work being done in neuroscience showing you can't separate brain, the language network semantic processing from syntactical processing it's it's just the best work can't separate them right it's, it's just very difficult to, to to go ah this region's doing syntax and this region's doing semantics and then they talk to each other with some partitioned architecture it's not looking that way which i think is what you were beginning to say yourself right that they're they come together right yeah um but, you know, I think Ida's going to have to go any minute now. And she did have a question, right? Ida, you're still there. You should ask your own question before you get sucked up by the plane, right? Um, I'm, I'm worried that there's too much background noise, but if you can hear me. I'll do it. I'll do it. Okay. So, I mean, given that you're a believer in the weak language of thought argument, what Ida was really asking, so what, what would disprove it? In other words, what experimental program would need to be done it's a little bit like the question i asked about the boundary i don't think you need language of thought for moving your hand i don't think you need language of thought for using your cerebellum so what what would one what would one need to do to disprove the language of thought hypothesis um so i think that the the evidence for at least a moderate language of thought hypothesis is um, very strong, very compelling, because there are these, you know, there are there is this work, empirical work on, um, you know, at least in for some cognitive processes like language itself, you know, processing language itself, finding neural signatures of different, you know, linguistic structures, syntactic structures, uh, in, in neural events. Um, to me, that's very convincing. If, if, if no one could find anything like that, you know, if we looked and we get people to understand linguistic you know, structures or produce them and we put them in any scanner we, we, we have come up with, 
and we could never find anything in neural activity that seems to correlate in a clear way and, and, ha and, a, and have the features, the structure of the sentences that are being understood or the sentences that are being produced by, by the subject, that would be evidence against even a moderate language of thought hypothesis, but that's not the case. Um, yeah, I mean, David Popple has got some nice work showing, you know, that there does seem to be this breakdown into these pieces, like you're saying, words, yeah. sentences, paragraphs. It, it does look like there are neural correlates yeah. of these packets. Yeah, you know, it, but, you know, there's there are, like, very distinguished philosophers who predicted the opposite, you know. Donald Davidson famously argued that there's no... Uh, psychophysical laws. Um, so, from that perspective, the 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 thought that you have of, you know, you love your spouse, let's say, there shouldn't be anything neural that correlates with that because that would mean there is a neural there, there's a psychophysical law, you know, or a psychoneural law. You know, there's some kind of neural signature of the thought. And so he he argued that there's no such thing. So you know, yeah. And we, also, I, I mean, Ida does make the, you know, Ida does you know, it would be nice to have a neural story that doesn't require language itself to prove the language of thought hypothesis, right? In other words, yes, that's why. I mean, it would be nice to sort of you know see a neural correlate like with object files, you know, or yeah. sort of sociable discrete object characteristics. And mm -hmm. I actually don't know of those kind of things where, as we said, a blue triangle disappears behind an obstacle and a red triangle comes out, people still go, oh, it's a triangle. They continue to track it. They don't care that it's octopus like changed its colors. It, you know, it's like when you see an octopus, when it changes its colors, you don't say, oh, it's not the same octopus, right? We seem to be able to do that. And right. that's very language of thoughty, right? We can break things out into discrete so I don't actually know I, I, it, how much neural data there are for that. I, there must be, right? I mean, I just yeah. just to be clear, are you saying having dissociable multi-scale representations of language is sufficient for moderate language of thought? Can you say that again? I put it in the chat, uh, just dissociable and multi-scale representations of language, like sentence level, word level, paragraph level. Are you saying having those dissociations of representations at different scales in the brain are sufficient for moderate and weak language of thought? Yeah, mm -hmm. yes. Okay, thank you. Yes, but it, you know, as John also points out, you know, you could try to go from there to explain other cognitive capacities with something like that beyond language itself yeah and so exactly so for instance sorry i found uh, multi-scale representations of space at different scales in the brain so you're saying that my findings would also be consistent with weak or moderate language of thought even though it's in the spatial domain uh well, it depends on how this representation of space works. It, you know, if there's something, you know, like how language-like are these representations of space? So what makes them language? Like, that's the part that I want to understand. What makes non-linguistic multi-scale representations? Exactly. So, that's, so the thing is, when we are representing language itself, the fact that we find neural signatures of linguistic structure in the brain you know, makes it very compelling that there's something language-like there going on. It literally represents linguistic structures. Um, when we go outside of linguistic cognition in a strict sense, uh, it becomes, you know, trickier to, to, to say, oh, this is a language-like structure. I think it just comes down to maybe we should have listed, but, you know, the examples in perception, if I remember in, whether it was Chaz or Jake, you know, you can remember that the book is open or closed, independent of what color it was or what it was made out of, right? In other words, you, and, and you can stress working memory, visual working memory independently 
for book open closed, what color, what, what shape. In other words, there does seem to be a decompositionality of features of objects into these separate components, which you can then decompose them into and build them up into. Now, this is not my area, but reading this work, they're saying that there's a constitutive, combinatorial, discrete, kernel-like structure and you can say is the square inside the circle and outside and all those sort of things and see them and not be linguistic to Ida's question and they seem to have some of those language of thought requirements that language itself doesn't have and that's the argument they're making now whether there's an implicit perceptual non-verbal form of language of thought i find those perceptual experiments quite convincing um and i think that they meet some of the criteria of, you know that people have laid out for language of thought sorry um, are you saying compositionality and multi-scale representations are sufficient or are there other things like systematicity or other things what are the lists of criteria for non-linguistic representations to be language like i got here i'd love to hear if you have some criteria top three yeah so thank you um i would not consider a compositional combinatorial representational system by itself language like it would have to have at least something recognizably like a um, subject predicate structure. And what that would amount to, you know, in terms of neural evidence is not obvious at all. Because are we just talking about two different populations of neurons that are synchronized? Is that all there is to subject predicate structure? Hopefully not, because that, that's ubiquitous. There's like synchronies between neural populations all over the place in all kinds of systems that do all kinds of things. So yeah, it's tricky, but I don't, you know, yeah. So the, that's why like, to me, the, the empirical evidence that says, oh yeah, we can keep track of objects. And even though they change features, um, we could do it with like this linguist, you know, language like representational system. Yeah, we could. But, you know, how does the brain do it? And until, you know, I think we can come up, we can probably come up with some account of that um, that doesn't involve anything super language-like, I would think. Either that is, yeah, it's, it's logic, you know, predicate structure and logical operators, right? In other words, right. they have it seems like they have to have some of those features as well. And the logical operators have to operate on something that already has kind of a sentential structure, you know, like a subject predicate. It's the not subject just, it's not just operate, combining yeah. things, you know. So I have a question. Um, GPT-4 can solve a lot of different types of logical stuff, but it cannot understand not very well. You tell it not to do something, it still says it. Does that mean it doesn't have language of thought? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question um i don't know but it's it's certainly like missing you know if it if it can't if it's bad at not doing things it's it might be missing some important aspect of the language like structure that our thought does have because you know we can understand negation I mean, the question well. is, I mean, negation, it's the tricky question, too. Right? There's like all you know, all these experiments where people mess up, but still. Um, I mean, negation, the question is, you're right, is when can you have subject predicate structure and logical operators and all those and, and, and combinatorials and primitives and discrete objects, blah, blah, blah. But when it comes to what Ida just said about not, right, is that now a linguistic term? In other words, it, it, or, is, or can it exist independently of understanding what the meaning of not is? Or is it, 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 it gets hairy, right? I, I, <laughs> I, I, I don't know where not gets to get, where, what bucket does not fit in, in your view?
Yeah. Um, so could it, you know, would it be something that we learn by interacting with other linguistic creatures or does that, you know, my guess would be there there's precursors, you know, there's representational precursors of negation that are not full like logical negation, but they can be acquired, you know, in a non-linguistic way. And then, you know, if you learn the word for negation, no or not, in English, um, you might be finally able to acquire logical negation proper, but um, yeah, it's a good question. That's what's, so ironic, it's what's so ironic is that the large language models were trained on language, but they're particularly struggling with a word that they haven't linguistically understood. In other words, they, it, there's something delicious about that, that it's... Yeah that they're doing something else than actually understanding semantics. Or they're still missing something before they, they fully understand uh, semantics the, the way people do. Yeah. 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 Uh, did Hoken had a question, I think. Hoken, do you want to appear in the room? Do you want to ask your question? You've been doing a lot of chatting. And then Anna, I don't know which Anna that is, but that looks like an interesting point there in the chat. Do you know who that is, Ida? So Hokin Anna. Anna, who's a philosopher from Berlin. Um, do, so so do, do we want to invite either Hokin or Anna to ask Gualtiero? I invited them. Let's see if it works. Great. Hey. They disappeared for some reason. Let me try again. I don't know what happened. Uh... I'm going to do it again. Apologies for background noise. Please go ahead. Oh. oh. <laughs> Please go ahead. Oh. For some reason, it's not working today. Let's see. I'm going to try again <laughs> one last time. If it doesn't work this time. Okay. Can Anna please ask your question? Ah, so, so. I'm, I'm, you can hear me and see me and I'm not disappearing in a second, you promise? Um, yeah, I'm, I really liked your question, Ida, about what does it mean to be language-like? Because not many philosophers really give a good definition of it. And I think, and it's just my impression, and I would be curious what the others think, um, that they sort of take it as Whatever is symbolic is language-like. But I don't know whether this is really convincing because being symbolic is just a certain kind of, you can post hoc see that there are logical inferences or something like that. But is that all what captures language-likeness? And then, so my question would be, okay, parts of language likeness might be symbolic, but is it all? Or give me a good definition of language likeness. Yeah, uh, thank you. And um, you're, you're right that the word symbolic was used, especially in the early days, like in the 70s and 80s, a lot in this context. Um, that just raised the question of what do we mean by symbol or symbolic? You know, there's a there's 
multiple things it can mean. One is very like weak. It's just something with some kind of semantic content, but there's lots of things that have semantic content. They don't have to be language-like. So symbolic by itself doesn't entail language-like in any way, or it could be a syntactic, you know, like a system of symbols with a syntactic structure analogous to the syntactic structure of a language with the distinction between things like predicates, subjects and predicates um, that, that have the right sort of semantic roles that are distinct from each other. And then since they are syntactically distinguishable, they can be processed accordingly. So then that starts to be more um, language-like. Um, when you have like this stronger notion of a symbolic system. Hmm. I'm still not satisfied, to be honest. Well, and I think there's a continuum too, you know, there because what I what I described as the strong language of thought doesn't just have a syntactic structure for the symbols or the representations, mm -hmm. but also instructions for processing those, and both are digitally coded in a broad sense, you know, discrete states, if you will. Um, so you have the instructions and the data, and they both have a syntactic structure that's analogous to that of a language. So there's at least a distinction between subjects and predicates. Um, and then, but so, so maybe I reformulate my question if you have time. Hmm. So, 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 um, if we say being symbolic is something similar as being language like, and at the same time, we're saying being symbolic, it's always something what we can transfer to symbolic computer programming code. Then we have three elements which seem to be somehow very similar, and I don't see how those relations are justified. So because then I could go backwards and say whatever I can code symbolically is language-like. And that's a strange claim. Isn't that? Or would you even say that? Um, well, I'm not totally sure I'm following, but I would say that just because you can represent something with symbolic code, that doesn't mean that what you're representing is itself symbolic or language-like. So if my neurons represent language, mm -hmm. they do it in a symbolic way. Mm, meaning, what do you mean by symbolic? I mean, I'm just still trying to answer the question, what does it mean to be language-like? Yeah, so what, in one of my slides, I, um, I you know, very briefly, I kind of hinted at the fact that you can draw different analogies between a representational system and a language. Mm -hmm. um, for one thing, there's different types of language too. There's natural language, there's artificial languages, there's computer languages, um, and they're not exactly the same. They have some similarities between them, but they're not all, all, all the same. Um, and then you can draw more or fewer analogies between say neural representations of some sort and language of some sort. So yeah there's a there's a whole family of views here depending on exactly which analogies you're drawing and then so if ida is finding a certain kind of representation in the pre cortex which is looks symbolic somehow then she is allowed to say oh that's language like well that, again, that depends on what you mean by symbolic. But if if you find <laughs> if you find neural representations that you know correlate with certain words in a language, and then they can, can be combined in ways that corresponds to sentences in a language, you know, I I think the most reasonable thing to say is that that's language-like representations because the stimuli themselves or the responses are themselves linguistic. And there's this correspondence between the neural and the and, and the linguistic. It, it mm -hmm. gets trickier when you're not dealing with linguistic cognition or 
you know, linguistic stimuli, linguistic responses, you're, you're doing perception, you know, visual perception. So what counts as language like there? I, that's get, it, it's harder to pin down. I mean, you probably know the best game in town, the reemergence of language of thought hypothesis of this paper in behavioral brain science. Mm -hmm. And then they see in everything theory, um, um, language of thought popping up in any kind of representation. And that was very confusing for me. Yeah, so they, um, first of all, they, um, they don't really distinguish between, you know, weak, moderate, yeah. digital and strong. Uh, they, you know, they, they refer to photo, they refer to us so like classical computational theories and they make it sound like they're in that tradition, but they don't say anything about computer instructions being there. Um, they do say it's this, you know, discrete structures. They have predicates, sub subject predicate structure. And that makes it sound like at least the, the representations are language-like in a strong digital sense. Um, but they don't, they don't even really say much about the processing. They don't say anything about the machine or the architecture. So, you can, you know, you can go from what they say towards a moderate language of thought or a digital or a strong language of thought. You know, they're, it's sort of underdetermined where they fit in the space of possible architectures. Um, and that's the, strength, that's the, so just to your point, Anna, that's the strength of that article. First of all, they do not see language of thought everywhere. They come up with a set of criteria like either <laughs> ask for, and then they look at experiments that meet some of those criteria. Um, I think this is an example where you, the cognitive science is the way to go, which is what they're doing. All the philosophical stuff, you know, like in certain other areas gets in the way and leads to just stagnant conversations <laughs> that we really need to stop. Or we go prematurely to the neural data, right? And the neural data aren't really ready yet. So in other words, what's nice about that is that it's basically a cognitive science perspective, which is, are there certain behaviors that seem to be non-linguistic, like Ida's asking for? In other words, they're doing exactly, I mean, I agree with Ida, what you want is some non-linguistic behaviors. You want to borrow from language some of the characteristics that, that you can more genuinely call language of thought, and then just look at some empirical data. And in, in this is an example, I think, where the philosophy on the left and the neuroscience on the right are not helping, right? And we need to be a little bit more neutral, right, about it. And just look at the experiments. Now, if you don't think that some of the experiments that they use to cite some of those features, yeah. you don't buy it. In other words, they give you the list, they give you the experiment, and you don't buy the mapping between the list and the experiment. That's one objection. Or you can say the list, you don't buy the list. Okay. But those are separate from implementation. And again, this obsession with digital notions of it, right? But my, my I'm a fan of that paper because they take a cognitive science perspective. It's non-neural. Mm -hmm and it's non-philosophical, right? And they're not obsessed with thinking about von Neumann architecture, right? And it, and it seems to me that that's interesting because, you know, maps, icons, objects, images, they have some of these features. Um, if, it, if language of thought is just completely synonymous with language itself, then it's not a very useful concept, right? Galtiero, I mean, it... it it has to survive a non-linguistic treatment. Um, well, I mean, non. It has to be. There have to be examples that can't be language. It's right? likely. It's likely that that some of the structures, some of the neural systems that are capable of processing language are also involved, or something like that is also involved in other in some other cognitive process. Well, although we know in neurological patients that um, imagery, navigation, mathematics, and language all dissociate. 
They're not dependent on each other, actually. Yeah, yeah. Have, no, well, I meant, I just meant that, so the, I don't know, the, the neural systems involved in math, let's say, might share some interesting features with those that are involved in processing language. Yeah. 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 So if but, the, I mean, the latter are a little language-like, the former might also be somewhat language-like. And... But, 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 but Gautero, just so I know, the, the list, yeah. I think there were six or seven features in that paper that's now gone up in the chat. Do you disagree with those features that they listed? Well, so the last one, I think, was a modal representation. I don't think that has anything to do with language. Um, and then there's, see, I don't remember them all off the top of my head. I don't know if I can find the list here. Um, they have set subject predicate structure. That's definitely language li the linguistic. There's discrete something, discrete components or something like that. That to me suggests that it's a digital representation, which I think is a problem. Um, and then I think the other ones are also debatable whether they're they're uh, involving language, except for logical inference involving sentences. That um i think they have something like that and that one is also tied to uh linguistic representations if you will the, at least if you put it that way i i think the i think um considering digital and discrete synonymous is a huge problem well so again all these terms can mean different things <laughs> but digital in the in in, in the basic sense means discrete within a computational architecture, something like that, you know, the, the discrete states that the computer, the computer computing system operates on and it can distinguish reliably from each other and so forth. Um, but then, you know, there's a stronger notion of digital, which is involving, you know, mathematical digits, you know, ones and zeros, like arithmetical notation. That's not what I mean by digital. But you, but but you, but if you divide up an object into color, shape, and size into those discrete notions, that's perfectly okay and doesn't imply anything digital. Um, okay, but that's that's kind of a distinction of ca categories. Okay, so yeah, color, shape. Um, it's, um, but they're discrete say apply to a single object, right? Yeah. But it doesn't tell us how these are, you know, encoded in, in no system. one cares about that. In other words, what I'm saying is that this well, whole, you, maybe you don't, <laughs> a lot of people I, care, but I think that the, I think a very important issue here is not to collapse you know, behaviors at the task level and the kind of experiments that cognitive scientists do to show dissociations and to show language of thought-like behavior, it is completely agnostic to the neural implementation. And it seems to me that you keep collapsing neural implementation with what behavioral experiments are showing at the task level, right? Those are two different things, right? Um, they're not, then you, you can do cognitive science and not record a single neuron. Uh, I, I wouldn't put it like that. You know, I, I would say you can certainly do behavioral experiments, but if you want to explain the behavior, you need to tell me something about the neural no, I, mechanisms. I, I, I just and don't maybe you that. say it in a very sketchy way, but. You know, so in other words, about. in other words, the p linguists who do all sorts of interesting stuff about the structure of language because they haven't recorded neurons have very little to tell us about the structure of language. Well, you don't have to record from neurons to know things about neurons, and you can still, you know, talk about neural representations without recording from neurons. Um, but if we wanted to get to um, Hawkins' question, we should probably. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I have an extremely Asian like philosophy question. 
is that when we, when we talk about all these computation models, like in the last like thir like twenty thirties, like during during those times, automata, definite automata, final like those, all those like computation models, all the way into Turing machines, they are all based on mathematics. It's like when when Turing have his Turing machine out at the same time, Church have the lambda calculus. It's actually they define extremely formally, like as a, a like formally as a mathematical system which is the lambda calculus and it's also like the Turing machine and then at a, also at the same time like we, we have like Benjamin Russell having the like fun, like problem with like the foundation of mathematics and so on and so forth but now we have all these these, these different kind of set theories so so what I want to ask is that Turing machine like uh like like the the pointer in itself is actually like it's almost like a uh, synonymous to the counting act like 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 when you define number is that you the succession definition in the in 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 like piano theorems like you count one two and then and that's that's also where turing have the pointer that you move on the tape and without this like it's, it seems very hard to define the Turing machine and and then when you when you have the Turing machine and then you have all these computational models on top of Turing machine because Turing machine like you have the you have, you, have, you have the proof that like like all the computers are by definition that is Turing complete and so on and so forth so so my question would be but at the same time you have the you have the you have the incomplete theorems that mathematics in itself is it's not like you cannot uh like you are not able to have uh uh you are not able to have a mathematical system that does not have an axiom like and then at that time you have a lot of philosophers saying that mathematics in itself is like separated for natural language natural language is like mathematics and natural language are two different things like it's all like last century debates in philosophy so i'm trying to figure out that like how could we step over that 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 kind of debate that 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 kind of philosophy that that like like we have the incomplete theorem that mathematics is incomplete at the same time we we we, we build all the computational computational models on top of the Turing machine which Turing machine is all the computation that is Turing complete but Turing complete is not all the mathematics that you can do you are not able to actually do real numbers calculations on lambda calculus like because like with that proof so so i I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out that like like it's like they they actually left over a lot of philosophy problems that like i don't feel like people touch on now but like i i just like and then we we start thinking about oh, like like we start talking about like like this like seems like the second century of like the second half of last century we, we people just don't talk about those issues i i just get confused like like because like what about those problems? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, um, Hawking. This th you're raising a whole cluster of issues having to do with the relation between a computational architecture like Turing machines and formal yeah, systems, yeah. mathematics, yeah. completeness or incompleteness of mathematics. Um, but that's essential. But that's essential for computationalism as a philosophy. Yes. There's like, like, a whole, like, there's at least yeah. one complete talk to give to address your questions. The, I think the best I can do is I, I, I published a book in 2020 called Neurocognitive Mechanisms Explaining Biological Cognition. And I get into some of those issues that you're uh, asking. Um, there's, there's one chapter, I think it's chapter 10 on the, uh, what I call the church, well, what Jack Copeland calls the church doing fallacy, which deals with some of that. And then there's other, there's other material in, in other parts of the book. If you email me, I can send you more specific page numbers and things. I can even send you a copy of the book if you want. Um, but I do talk about some of this stuff and like how to fit it in the, in a neurocomputational story. There, there's something called the mathematical objection to machine intelligence. This is Turing's, um, Turing's label that he also discussed at the time. And there's a whole literature on that that you were kind of referring to. So yeah, so there's a lot to say about that. But it's, you know, maybe we're out of time and it would take a while to get to everything. 
I, I do think it's an important question. I mean, you know, and it's interesting in your book, Gualtiero, is, you know, you seem to be of two minds, whether, you know, universal Turing machines, digital computers, you know, analog versus digital computation. I mean, how useful is that whole slice of history that Hokin is referring to, to trying to get at the biological basis for thought, language, movement? I mean, I have to admit, you know, I've read your book. I, I just don't know how relevant it is, quite frankly, to doing a cognitive neuroscience of language and other things. I mean, do you, I mean, you know, we can finish. It, you know, are the things that have been raised by Hokin, I mean, part of me wants to stay, who cares, right? It's interesting, it's intellectual history. But, you know, as intellectual history, I think it's really interesting. But, but is it really something that, you know, the people you admire, the neuroscientists who are trying to get at the basis for certain cognitive operations, I mean, how important is it to worry about these things? Then you are well, not analytical. It's important if you want to at least like aim for a comprehensive theory of cognition insofar as cognition includes mathematics and therefore whatever is the case with regards to mathematics needs to be accounted for in a theory of cognition. So if let's say mathematics or you know some mathematical theories are undecidable and then if you that convinces you that um no turing machine could capture those mathematical theories because they're undecidable um because because you know a turing machine can only give you basically a procedure for something that is decidable decidable meaning you know an algorithm can decide it um then what are you going to do about those aspects of mathematics that are undecidable? Yeah, but that's a human concern. In other words, it, to the degree that you believe that there are cognitive operations that are worthy of study in macaques, in chimpanzees, and we want to understand language of thought-like architectures for all those non-linguistic, non-mathematical operations, who cares? Well, no, I mean, obviously, if you're, if you're studying macaques, that's great. Uh, it's just that some people have even argued that because mathematics is undecidable or is incomplete we need something more powerful than turing machines to understand cognition so people have said things like that and i'm not one of them i don't think it's necessary but but it's tricky to say what do you need you know so do you need something that's not computable in there like like a, turing called it a random element you know like some kind of random process that affects how you try different things and test different ideas so that could be an ingredient in a theory of cognition. Yeah, because I think a lot of people listening will go, is the type of non-linguistic, non-mathematical language of thought formulation that you know we assume is happening in non-humans, how important is all this stuff about universal Turing machines to that kind of neuroscience? And, you know, I'm asking you non-polemically, how important is it if you had the money to engage in a neuroscience program, which I know you'd be interested in, and you only had macaques to work on, is any of this stuff really that relevant? Um, well, this, this stuff about the scope of mathematical knowledge yeah. and whether yeah. it's captured by yes. three machines, no, it's not directly relevant. Right. But, 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 but you are, but, but you, but, but epistemology comes first. Like, like when you, when we are making claims about language of thoughts, like. No, I don't, I just, I, I, I like, think, like, yeah. I, I just think, Hokin, that what's nice about what, you know, has been put forward and what, is that you know a language of thought way of considering cognition really doesn't have to live or die on incompleteness in mathematics i mean i just i just think that if that's the case we're in a very very strange place scientifically but eventually i mean if we want to get have a comprehensive theory of cognition intelligence thought um we 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 need to look for something to say about that too and people have said things some of which are more reasonable than others so we can also try to assess 
those ideas. Yeah, I mean, it would be it would be nice if we can get to that point where we've gotten so far along that we can get to this final hurdle of cognition where we're beginning to explain language and mathematics. But you know, my understanding was that the language of thought considerations, like somebody in the chat has said, extend to non-humans. Right. Um, Good. Now, Good. you would agree with that, right, Qualterra, that language of thought, as you're formulating it, is not a human-specific formulation. Right. It doesn't, it certainly not, doesn't have to be. Um, and it's, you know, that becomes an empirical question. How much of cognition is explained by something that's language-like? And does it apply only to human cognition or aspects of human cognition or also other species? Yes. Can, can, can I ask a follow up like philosophy question? Like, like the, what, do you, what do you think about language and thought and Kant? Like, like the Kantian systems? Like, like, yeah, yeah. Like, I, I just feel like they are the same. Like, they are almost saying the same thing. Just cut, like, he's much like older. Like, he, like, 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 yeah. Yeah, uh, well, I know it depends which kind of language of thought idea. Certainly, Kant, I don't think Kant was into computation as a naturalistic explanation of cognition. Um, but there's definitely some language like features in the way Kant thinks about thinking. Um, yes, very much so. So at least a, at least a weak language of thought idea is very present in Kant, I would say. Because because Kant has Kant does not have all the problems of mathematics and computation at his time. Just like your intelligence has a system or like a structure, something like that. That's like he does not did not need to deal with like those those other problems. It's like it's like language of thought without a computational flavor in it and then so I, I i just like i just get confused like which which part is the more relevant is the is the kantian like like in here like kantian aspect or is the turing aspect like is the is like the turing aspect as like you can have this kind of computational models that you get and then you do you do you do you do the Turing machine, you do the pointer, and then you calculate, and then you do all these mathematics, and then you will solve the problem. You get programmable, like system, and then you can learn this system, can learn the computation aspect, or like the old Kantian aspect of it. Like, well, like what know, was I mean, actually the more, yeah. So Kant didn't have, you know, the the the, the kind of naturalistic framework. We're thinking about thinking in a kind in a you know in a modern way. So he had some he had some creative ideas and ways of conceptualizing cognition, and some of it even may, might have been influential in the history of cognitive science. But it's very you know dated. It's all it's like a sophisticated folk psychology from our perspective. You know, it's it's not real science or or even like leaning towards a scientific psychology. Anna, did you have another question? I mean, we're going to wrap up. I think Walter has been extremely uh, shown great stamina and patience with this bombardment. Um, I, I, I have a very <laughs> yes, no question. What was that? I have a yes, no question. That's easy. Go ahead. Okay, it's thinking about Bayesian approach as suggesting a format of how implementation are to be described. Um, I ask you whether you think it's a good idea to marry probabilistic reasoning to symbolic systems. Would you go to this reading? Um, yes and no. <laughs> yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, philosophers never answer a question by yes or no. Well, so yes, there's, there's probabilistic stuff all over the, the cognition. So, of course. Um, but then, you know, how like explicitly represented in a language like way are the neural representations or the content of the neural representations? That is a tricky question. So if you look at the, the, the stuff 
and again, and again, I'm not that much of an expert, but like the Tenenbaum program of Bayesian co computational cognitive science, that sounds a little too heavy on the symbolic structures. Um, and in fact, you know, even he, he doesn't say, well, this is how the brain works. He says, the, this is an approximation or the brain approximates this kind of Bayesian inference. Um, and that raises its own questions. What, what do you mean by approximate? How close is the approximation? What, is the, what does the approximation? Why don't we just theorize in terms of the system that does the approximating instead of the Bayesian representations? So yeah, um, yeah, a lot of interesting questions there. So yes and no. Good. I, I just have one last it's a token, I, 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 it has to be a question, not a 25-minute yeah, yeah. lecture, okay? okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so what can a philosophy do? Like, what can a, what can a philosopher do, like, 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 despite ethics and not be a scientist? Like, like, is, like, is, is philosophy ended? Like, if a philosopher do not, like, deal with science? Like, like, in, in the sense that, like when quantitative scientists and neuroscientists all step into the this kind of mathematics, um, epistemological problems, and then what can a philosophy philosopher do, like as his job, despite like doing Ask, ethics, asking like, the right questions. Got, got it, got it. No, philosophy yeah. doesn't end. It doesn't end. It gets harder because it needs to take into consideration more science, um, and the science itself gets harder. So. Everything gets harder, but it, it, philosophy doesn't end. <laughs> I mean, like um, like Hassock Chang has said, right, that philosophy is complementary science, that it zeroes in on things that scientists often don't want to worry about, don't have time to worry about, leave on the side. They have other things they want to do, but that doesn't mean they've covered all the bases. And philosophers can actually help deal with those components that the, I mean, scientists have tastes. Scientists have their favorite things. They can't consider in depth all the questions thrown up by their work, right? In other words, there's too much to be done. And what's nice about philosophical training is that there are certain aspects that are there to be looked at that the scientists probably don't look at as much because they don't have that kind of training so in other words they complement each other i'm very yeah i'm, I'm a believer in that hassock chan view um, now whether whether you want to call it philosophy or science well you know but, but there's room for different types of thinking in any given subject area wouldn't you agree with that gualtiero i agree 100 percent. yes yes and also there's a lot of philosophy that ends up being bullshit because it does not even respond to empirical evidence or, you know, let's say the scientific developments. So, you know, it both goes both ways. You know, there's scientists who are just doing their own thing without really reflecting on what it means. And there's philosophers who are just reflecting without taking into consideration. And there's evidence against that, those ideas. There's an irony. There's a delicious irony to this, which is that, one of, you know, given that we've been talking about language of thought and language and linguistics, you know, one of the problems when it came to scientific topics, when they uncoupled from empirical evidence, like Gualtiero is saying, is when they started to have purely linguistic based explanations for things, right? In other words, it, that's what's so delicious and ironic here is when, when there was a sort of a linguistic turn that turned to the philosophy of science i think philosophy started to be less interesting when it came to things like emergence cognition it because it was worried too much about the structure of sentences and utterances about the world and uncoupled from empiricism would you agree with that well Chero, that there's a kind of irony here that too much worry about the linguistics of explanation made it look like you could uncouple from the empirical evidence and it became problematic in my view. Yeah. Would, you, would, you, mm -hmm. would you agree with that? Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. Yeah. I mean, there, yeah, you know, nobody's perfect. So <laughs> philosophy has a lot of flaws and, <laughs> and, uh, and you have to, you have to take it with a grain of salt too. 
Well, listen, um, I, Ida, I think is, I can't believe this, but I think she's in the air and still on the learning salon. <laughs> we can't get rid of Ida. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but, you know, well, Terry, you know, we've gone over two and a half hours and 15 minutes. You've been a trooper. Um, unless there's some final parting words, you know, certainly from you, you're the guest, you have the last word, uh, or anyone is absolutely dying to answer, um, I think we should wrap up. Um, any, any last words, Gualchera? Thank you very much for having me and for the conversation. It was, it was very thought-provoking and, and, and fun. And we're looking forward to your work with David. Thank you. Um, all right. Thank you, Hokin. Thank you, Anna. And of course, thank you, Ida. And Gualchero, big hug. You too. Take care, Ciao. everyone. Bye. Bye.